This is the last leg of my Haitian journey. Gonna learn about black history from a Haitian context, while getting to sample some playful Haitian cuisine. Rito Joseph, a Haitian Canadian who gives guided tours of Montreal, highlighting spots from a black history context. This is why I'm born and raised in the city of Montreal. Yeah. And you're recognizable because you're tall too, right? As well. I've never seen it. Yeah. What do you actually look like? And is see. this a Haitian neighborhood? Or? Uh, this park right here is named after Toussaint Louverture. This is Habitation Jeanne Mars, aka Downtown Projects. Yeah. So it's not a Haitian neighborhood per se, but you have a uh, you have few Haitians living a few here. Haitians, but okay. it's not one of those places where you would find the most Haitians in the city. He balances out perspectives from the textbooks with voices of peoples who have been conveniently omitted from history. If you are remotely interested in the struggle for human rights, you gotta know Black Spartacus, the Napoleon Noir, the liberator of slaves, Toussaint Louverture. So Toussaint Louverture is the one that spearheaded uh, the Haitian Revolution. So he did not see um, Haiti gain its independence. Right. He was in prison in France at what you call Fort de Joux. So he died in France. Right. And uh, while he was in France, you know, he requested to have a conversation with Napoleon. Napoleon would never face him. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think Napoleon might have been scared of, of, of uh, his aura, his energy. Mm -hmm. So here in Canada, you know, uh, a lot of history books talk about the abolition of slavery. They, they say that, you know, it was uh, John Simcoe's at the catalyst of the abolition of slavery okay. uh, in Upper Canada, which would be nowadays Ontario. Right. In 1793. But in 1794, Simcoe went to Haiti, uh, which was known, then known as uh, Saint-Domingue. Okay. Colony of Saint Domingue, he was trying to reinstate slavery there, and he was he right. was defeated by uh, Toussaint Louverture. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So Toussaint Louverture is this guy that's uh, I think I would say he's bigger than life. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have Desalines, we wouldn't have Christophe, we wouldn't the have job. yeah, oh, everybody, everybody, everybody. We wouldn't have a, 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 an actual revolution. His achievements were so legendary that a half century before the American Civil War in the late 1700s, he inspired abolitionists like John Brown in the US, who with Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman's actions were a precursor to emancipation from slavery. Wait, 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 hold up. What made Toussaint so great? What were conditions like before and after he died? And how is present day Haiti affected by this? We gotta go way back to the beginning. Over 500 years ago, when European recorded history began, which I will attempt to impossibly sum up in less than five minutes. I'm gonna move fast, so keep your arms and legs inside the cart at all times. Columbus discovered the island in 1492 in which the indigenous Taino people inhabited. He famously wrote back to his investors in Spain, these people are kind and they'll make great servants. After brutalizing the indigenous Taino people through slave labor, torture, rape, disease, and cutting off ears, noses, and body parts with the same fervor as kids collecting Mr. Potato Head pieces in the 1980s, the population was reduced from approximately a mil, depending on which accounts you read, to about 50,000. As early as the 16th century, with no more Taino peoples to exploit, the Spanish needed more slave labor to cut the sugar cane, grow the coffee, cotton, and other crops. So they turned to Western Africa as their source to import slaves. Fast forward to 1697, when the western third of the island changed hands from Spanish to the French and the eastern two-thirds stayed with Spanish in what is modern-day Dominican Republic. Materially, the French side was so wealthy that it exported more than all of Britain's Caribbean colonies combined. But behind the scenes, it was one of the most brutal plantation systems in existence. It was cheaper for the slave owners to work their slaves to death and buy a new slave than to provide basic necessities of life for their existing slaves. So much so that the average life expectancy of a slave at the time was 25 years old. In the face of these conditions, Haitians led by self-taught former slave, the brilliant tactician Toussaint Louverture, started a well-organized slave revolt against the French in the late 1700s. Unfortunately, he was captured and died before he saw freedom realized, which Dessalines carried on. But becoming the first and only black republic in history to win independence was a point of pride, which still carries on in the consciousness of the Haitian people. A lot of the foods the slaves were not allowed to eat became part of the mainstream diet, such as jumu soup, which is eaten on Independence Day, which I endearingly refer to as fuck you soup. But being the pioneers of ending slavery came at a huge cost. The other colonist countries didn't recognize Haiti as a country. How could they recognize a black republic when they themselves used blacks as slaves and considered them inferior? Therefore, they didn't trade with them. How in God's name is a country going to grow their GDP being cut off from the global economy? In addition to this, France being like the schoolyard bully demanding lunch money, 
give an ultimatum to pay an indemnity of 150 million francs in reparations for the land the Haitians took or face the wrath of the French Empire. Wait, what the f- You kidnap families from Africa to work under brutal conditions for free and now you want them to pay you for taking their land back and compensating you for your lost labor force? This created a devastating cycle of debt which took 122 years to pay off. And even though reduced, not a cent of this has been paid back in reparations to Haiti. From there, it was a succession of brutal dictatorships backed by foreign powers like the U.S., ostensibly to help but really to protect their business interests. Dictators like Papa Doc and Baby Doc who ran autocratic militaristic regimes, which led to brain drain throughout the 70s and 80s. World Bank policies in the 70s led to poverty, disease, and chaos, crippled the country with cuts to education and health care. Devastating earthquake in 2010 kills 300,000 people. 2021 Haitian president assassinated ostensibly by a mix of foreign mercenaries and internal dissidents. Another earthquake in 2021. So for people who say, why can't Katie get their shit straight after 200 years? I urge you to go a little deeper into the history. We move on to more present day Haitians who have caused a stir. Daniel Laferriere. So yeah. Daniel Laferriere is one of the most known Haitian authors in the world. Oh, Gene Pendon in 2015. So, uh, moved to Montreal, mid, late 70s. Um, started to work as a janitor. Yeah. Lived in what is now uh, Square Saint Louis on the plateau. Uh, Danny Laferriere, man, what can I say about this guy, man? Controversial, man. He's gained his success with the book, Comment faire l'amour avec un nègre sans se fatiguer. So, literally translated into yeah. how to make love to a Negro without getting tired. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I think the official version in English would be how to make love to a Negro. Okay. The, the title, that sparks the, controversy right away. That's, that's a Right away, right title, away, right, right away, because he yeah. was hitting them. He was hitting them with the N word. He was hitting them with, like, you know. In the 70s. In the 70s. In the 70s, when it was eight, in yeah. mainstream to. Yeah. Interracial, interracial relationships too. Um, were faux pas back then, right? It was definitely. all faux pas. After filming this show, I did read this book. As much as it is provocative, it's beautifully well written, capturing the racial zeitgeist of the moment in a way that was palpable. Non sombré dans la nostalgie du passé. Non. After hours of walking to various sites, Rito, like all good guides, senses my glazed look. The scorching Montreal sun is withering my brain's capacity to synthesize any more data. He suggests drinks and foods to recalibrate the cortex. We've already had quite a spectrum of Haitian dishes, ranging from the basics to the high end. It's time for something right in the middle. We head to Picles, a restaurant strategically located next to St. Henri subway station. A cozy place with an island vibe playing music of the Caribbean. The owner, Akeem, is friendly and accommodating, and his resemblance to Tupac has got Dear Mama playing in my head. He pours some wonderful hibiscus lemonade, which brings me back from the dead like smelling salts. Unfortunately, Piklis doesn't have their alcohol license, but Akeem slaughtered that. His friend who owns the bar next door shows us some Quebecois hospitality. Tell us where we would start. All right, all right. So you have to start with the, the patties, Haitian yeah. patties. You have beef patties and codfish. These are the entrées, so you start with that. You have the aioli sauce that's pretty good with it. Haitian patties are quite different than the ubiquitous Half Moon Jamaican patties. The dough is flakier with a puff pastry shell, enveloping usually beef, chicken, or fish, seasoned with your usual punch and aromatics, like onion, garlic, pepper, and herbs, with a side of aioli sauce. The essential fried plantain, banan pesé. Okra fried with tomatoes and onions flavored with the obligatory Haitian apiece. Traditional ricole with red beans. Panko shrimp with garlic and parsley. Salad liquet. Homemade cucumbers, tomato, onion, and homemade dressing. Macaroni salad in a light mayo base sprinkled with sweet paprika. The food is tasty, and with the music playing, I feel like I'm on a Haitian beach. After bidding our adieus to the Haitian Tupac, Rito convinces us to take the 45-minute hike up Mont Royal, a mountain with a chalet at the top promising picturesque views of the city. And he doesn't disappoint. The view on the summit is spectacular. As our time in Montreal comes to a close, I come away with a stronger understanding of Haitian cuisine and culture. But I'm not fooling myself. We only touch the tip of the iceberg on what Haiti is, was, and the potential for what it could be. We didn't get into voodoo, an intrinsic way of being for Haitians, and one of the most misrepresented spiritualities. 
nor Haiti's politics, which most Haitians as far away as Canada are reluctant to talk about, for fear of reprisal on their family members back home. Yes, it's that serious. We didn't cover Haiti's various musical styles, which just like the food, is influenced by the multiple cultures that inhabited and left their fingerprints. I'm not sure even 10 episodes on Haiti would give us a complete view. I'm just happy that I've learned something about a culture and cuisine I knew virtually nothing about. I've come away with a stronger sense of the struggle that Haitians faced at the hands of oppressors and how that cycle still continues. But most important, I've met some amazing resilient people who in the face of turmoil still maintain a sense of optimism and demonstrate kindness and realness. And from all this arises a sense of compassion. I hope one day to visit this beautiful island and experience all it has to offer firsthand. Next episode, we change gears entirely and start talking about the food, history, cultural, and struggles of peoples who have inhabited North America since time immemorial, indigenous North Americans.